Hey, Black Art in America fam, it's Najee Dorsey here for another installment of Buy It Talks. Recently, September 14th through the 16th, we had our Black Art in America Fine Art Show Philadelphia. Patrick McCoy was invited to give a talk about art collecting, Chicago style. Patrick's no stranger to Black Art in America. He's participated in a number of our shows and uh, programs throughout the years and was recently written up in the New York Times as a collective note. I uh, hope you enjoyed this particular talk that Patrick gave. He's always a crowd pleaser. And we thank you for tuning in for another installment of Bio Talks. I would thank you uh, and, and Black Art in America for inviting me, a Chicagoan, one of the co-founders of Diasporisms, into Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. Now, I emphasize with this title that I'm going to be talking about Chicago. And Chicago you know, has a moniker just like the city of brotherly love, Chicago is called the Windy City, right? All right, most people don't know what that really means. Most people remember or know that Chicago in the wintertime has unbelievably cold weather. And in the summertime, it is unbearably hot. And in each one of those situations, the wind does blow. I mean, it is really at 25 degrees below zero, 25 mile an hour wind. But that is not why the city, city of Chicago is called the Windy City. The city is called that because in the 1880s, Chicagoans, just like myself, would boast and brag about the city so much that they said, these people from Chicago are windy. So <laughs> I'm going to be starting this presentation in true Chicago style, and I'm going to start it with a boast and then I'm going to end with a bluster. <laughs> Can you go to the next slide, please? All right. As he said, that I've been uh, one of the co-founders of an art organization called Diaspora Rhythms, and I'm going to boast that Diaspora Rhythms is a Chicago-based organization that is unique in the whole of the United States. There is nothing like it. And that we are successful in over 15 years of getting people to accept and understand themselves as art collectors. All right, when I say unique, there are other organizations, art collectors organizations in this country. Almost all of them are affiliate organizations. They essentially have come together to assist a museum, one of the museums in whatever city they are. And these art collectors work, they raise money to buy something to give to that museum, all right? But they're not actually promoting art collecting. We are the only one where we came into existence, chartered as a 501c3 organization, nonprofit, with the purpose, next slide, uh, because we have been focusing on addressing a problem. And I'm going to say and promote that the biggest problem in the art scene today is we don't have an audience, that the audience is missing. And why do I say that? Even though we've got people out here, there should be thousands and thousands of people out here. We don't have an audience. Why don't we have an audience for one of the aspects of our culture where all the other aspects of the culture have no problems having an audience? music, dance, literature, poetry, uh, spoken word, fashion, all of those things have audiences and people are actually actively engaged in promoting and, and, and these things. Next slide. Our mission. We are to collect, promote, and preserve the art from the African diaspora. That's our focus. And by encouraging individuals like yourselves and institutions to acquire and appreciate that art. All right, for 15 years, We've been working to build the audience because we see that is the biggest problem. To get more and more people to recognize, recognize themselves as art collectors. Now, I'm going to emphasize that, recognize themselves as art collectors. And to make our collective cultural concept of what an art collector is, is that it be a big tent concept and not a little small golden umbrella, which is what I think most of people, when you really start to dig into their minds, that's what they think. It's just a very small number of people that are in this activity, and most people are not in it. 
we want to have a big tent where almost everybody's in it. All right. All right. Now, I said recognize because to become an uh, art collector was a journey, specifically for myself. I've been collecting art since 1968, but it was only in the early 2000s that I recognized myself as an art collector. And I have, after I did it, what I did is I started bending people's arms and cajoling and convincing all other people that I read, met in Chicago, you're an art collector. No, 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 you are an art collector. I want you to understand that. What, no, no, back, back. Uh, we've been growing from four members and we now have 70 plus and our, even though we have 70 active members, our influence is at least 100 times that. We, in a, in, on a routinely basis, we're affecting thousands of people in Chicago. All right, we say it's a journey because most of the work is unlearning. We want you to reject the myth and misconceptions that are in all of your heads right now about what an art collector is, what you believe an art collector is. Now, the converse is to be an art collector is really a very easy thing to do. And yet we make it so complicated. All you have to do to be an art collector is be a, a willing to look at art to go to places and so forth, whatever, to look at it, to be, uh, be accessible to look at it. Second, you see something you like? You ask and see if you can acquire it. If it's affordable for you, you buy it. That's what makes an art collector. You are collecting art. That's, it's when I recognized that that's all it was and all these other things that have, are the trappings that came along with it were not true. It was an epiphany for me. All right, next slide. All right, now why is this important for us to be art collectors? In philosophy, there's the three pillars. Of, of the, uh, one is the, all the arguments associated about what, uh, what is real. The second pillar is what is truth. And the third is what is good, aesthetics. So this is serious, that when you are dealing with the culture, you're dealing with something that is at the core of a people. So this act of being an art collector is an act of validating what you believe is good. And that is important even at minor, minor levels of just some small purchase and so forth. Next, please. But now, if it's so easy, why do we resist? Why do we, like I did, why do we resist uh, recognizing ourselves as art collectors? Why, what is the problem there when we see that it is so culturally important? Next slide. I'm going to pr propose that it comes down to what Du Bois says, that we always have a split consciousness. We are on one side, we have some things that are working that puts us into one world and then at the same time we have ideas and concepts that keep us in another world and we're always battling that. Du Bois said it perfectly, uh, you can see that we are two souls within a body and we are fighting each other. Okay, next slide. These two souls are one where we have sort of our history, our legacy from Africa, and we, still, we can't get out of that, especially when everybody is pushing it on us uh, through racism and so forth. We can't get out of that. And at the same time, we are part of this thing, America and so forth, and we have adopted and incorporated all these concepts in us too. So these, these ideas are constantly in battle with us. And they, in particular, have an effect on us being art collectors. Next. Because we have, on one side, accepted all the myths associated with art collecting that comes from this American scene. And we've adopted them, and they cause us to fight with our uh, cultural uh, mind that just looks at things and says, oh, I like that, which is very similar. In fact, I bring up the example all the time of if you look at the music component of culture, 
I'm talking today about art. If you look at the music component of culture, you don't have any barriers to entry. There's nothing that stops any person from being involved and say, oh, I like music, I'm done this way, or whatever it is, all types of music, there's no barriers. But we have barriers that block us from going, becoming art appreciators, okay? And you have to go and look at these myths, confront these myths, and reject them. As I said, you have to unlearn them. Okay, now, this is going to be audience participation. <laughs> these are some of the myths. And oh, for those who are purists, I do know about double negatives, but this is how they say it. <laughs> so, how many people have heard this? Raise your hand. Okay, I'm going to pick one of you to remind, uh, hey, keep your hands up. All right. Uh, okay, back here. Remind, remember this one. Remember this one. Next one, please. I should have bought, now you stick in the name of a famous artist piece. It would be worth a lot of money now. Who's heard that? Okay, you're back there, sir. You remember that one. <laughs> Next one. Okay, I'm not a collector. I just buy what I like. Anybody heard that? Okay, got you over there. <laughs> Next one. You got to educate people about art to get them to collect. Anybody heard of that? Okay, right here. You remember that? Okay. Next one. Okay, if you let them people in your house, they're going to come back and steal your art. <laughs> <laughs> Who's heard <there in> that? <laughs> All right. Okay. And this one? Everybody? Okay. All right. Next. Okay, now you have to say it the right way. Do you have... <laughs> Stick in the name of the artist. Do you have, you know, who's heard that? Sort of an elitist, uh, okay, you know, that. all right. The art scene is nothing but a big rigged game. Okay, all right, next one. Okay, now, stick in the name of the artist, just died. That piece you got of theirs is not worth something. Who's heard that? Okay, back there. Okay, next. Art, I'm an art collector. You should give me a deal. Who's that? <laughs> okay, and I think this is the next. If you're an art collector, you need to buy my work. Who's heard that? I know I have. <laughs> okay, these statements and questions reflect the myths and misconceptions surrounding the term art collector and have kept most people, I would add, say at least 90% of the people from identifying themselves as art collector, even when they are collecting art and therefore kept them out of the audience. When I say audience is that when there's a call or an uh, uh, act, event or activity associated with art, and somebody said, well, all the art collectors, art, art preachers come to this. Most people, it goes straight over their heads. They don't think of themselves as ever being part of that audience. So this is what I'm saying is that it's kept them out of the audience. Right, next. Okay, here are the myths. Now, who had the myth about the I can't, I, I can't, afford, I can't afford art? Was that back here? Who had the, I can't afford? Remember that statement? Well, this is, addresses this. Is there is a myth, and I do this at many of my talks, and I'll ask the audience, who has heard this? What, what is the first thing that you think of when you, think, when you hear the term art collector? And most people say, you have to be wealthy. You have to be rich. You have to have a lot of money. And that means that it's somehow in this cultural practice, this cultural activity, it's about a lot of money. And that the society, the American society, constantly promotes that. Who heard about the Kerry James Marshall sale? Everybody. Okay. The Kerry James Marshall piece that was owned by a public entity in the city of Chicago 
the, the McCormick place and so forth. I think they paid something like $25,000 originally for it. It was there for a number of years, maybe 20 years. And then all of a sudden they decided to auction it. And it went for $21.2 million. Great for the, for, for the, for the, the notoriety for the artist. But especially important was that uh, Sean Puffy Combs is the one who bought it. So everybody is excited that here a, a major piece has gone in auction by an African American and an African American bought it. And, but the thing that is constantly pushed was just how much it was. Now, that's the message that goes to people in their heads. And they're thinking, oh, Art costs $21 million? I can't even afford that. That's what they walk away with. Now, I happen to know, and I looked at the, that, that, that particular transaction with Combs buying that piece, and I actually believe he bought it for cultural reasons. Is that that piece, every figure has white on, and he's been a proponent of the white parties and I believe that it meant something to him. Even though it looks like somebody is doing this major investment concept. All right. Next one. Second myth is that you have to be a private person, a private uh, personality. You don't let people know what you have. You don't talk about uh, what you have. You, you are secretive and concerned with security about your artwork, you would never let people come in your house. Is that that is just verboten? You just don't do that. Is that uh, it's one day find out they know what you have and so forth. So this is a concept that we have been uh, uh, with our organization have been attacking. Uh, one the the rich, and then the second one of that you have to be private. Okay, next. All right, who's had, I don't know nothing. This is what this one's about, is that most people believe that if you say you are an art collector, that you have an academic, almost encyclopedic knowledge of art. You know everybody that has ever painted, sculpted, done whatever since time began. <laughs> <laughs> And if people can just bring you something and put it in your face, who did this and how much? <laughs> right. People do this all the time to me. I'm like, I have no clue. I don't know that. I, I studied chemistry and, and, and I'm like, I don't know that. Is that we strongly believe that you have to know something. That you have to know something about art in order to actually become an art collector. And I'm going to say just the opposite. You don't have to know anything. Because you don't have to know anything about music to love it, to like it, to acquire it. You have to know a thing. You don't have to know how to play it. You don't have to read it. You don't know how to sing. You, but you can be an avid, avid supporter of music. And you don't have to know a thing. So we don't need to know anything. What happens is that once you become, once you step over that line and say, oh yeah, I collect art, now you want to know things. You will seek out information. So it isn't a barrier, it is an activity that you get into once you accept the concept. Next. Now, this one dealt with dying and all that stuff, is that somehow people believe that everybody that says they're an art collector is a soothsayer, that they can know what the future is going to be, and that they can predict what the value of art, what the economic value of art. They can tell you if, you die, if the person dies, that that's gonna make it more important. No, it doesn't. It, over time, it doesn't make it important that just because time has passed. It's important because somebody invested cultural capital into that thing. All right? All right, some other myths that we have to dispel. One is about the artists. Let me tell you, they are not starving, okay? <laughs> they are not starving. And combined with the second one, their work is too expensive, okay? Starving, everybody's heard the starving artist statement, right? And everybody's heard people say, art is too expensive. I haven't 
gone to school and had to take some courses in reasoning and logic and so forth, and you put those two things together. Okay, what is it that a starving person makes that's too expensive for you to buy? <laughs> All right, if you get it, is that these got to be wrong. One of these has got to be wrong. All right, and again, it does not become more important if you die. It's important that you are seeing something that resonates with you, that is a part of your cultural concept, is it, it, something that is beautifying, it speaks to you. That's what makes it important. Okay, another thing that happens that's in, the, in the conversation, and it was one of those statements, is that people believe, especially a lot of the artists, that if you say you are an art collector, you are apt to, uh, acting like an art buying machine that you just have to buy. And that all they have to do is just put it in front of you. And then you have to, uh, I have had this, where an artist has a, a sort of a financial problem and they come to me like I'm the ATM machine. It's like, <laughs> I'm just supposed to, to give them money uh, for these pieces. They just, they just act as though you have to do that. The other, a concept is that art people that are speaking as art collectors feel as though they have some sort of privilege or, or uh, that to get a, a deal, to get something, they, uh, to be recognized as something better. It isn't. An art collector, just like if you collect music, you ain't no better than nobody else. It's that an art collector is just like anyone else. It is not anything different. Hey, Black Art in America family, did you know we just opened up our new space in Columbus, Georgia? The next time that you visit Georgia, make plans to venture to Columbus and take in the Black Art in America headquarters and home of the Najee Dorsey Studios. We're open by appointment Monday through Friday, but you can catch us on the weekend, Saturday and Sunday from 11 to 5 p.m. And be sure to shop with us at shopbuyaonline.com for works by some of the hottest contemporary artists and our legacy artists as well. For our mission, we have worked to dispel these myths that I've just described. You. And we've been doing it to redefine the concept of what an art collector is by our actions. We have been doing things. And here's a list. I'm going to read some of them. Artist studio visits. We go to artists in our community, uh, any artist will just, a group of us will go over there, let the artist talk to us about what they do, how they do it, what they, why they do it, and so forth. Sometimes we buy work, sometimes we don't, but it's the concept of just going and seeing art and hearing about what artists are thinking about. We also will invite artists to come and have a show at our homes so that they can uh, present their work to a set of people like in our organization and, and our friends and so forth. We will do that. We also have honoring activities for artists. We have, um, in the first 10 years, we would have a secret vote among our members, all of them are art collectors. We'd have a secret vote and would have the top five people and all of the collectors had to vote for an artist that they owned work. So it's not a popularity contest. You already have bought some of this person's work. So you vote and you say, I want this. Uh, I want this person to get the recognition. So we were, for every other year, for the first 10 years, we would recognize five artists out of our collection. So we were already collectors of that work and ba basically pushing them out to the larger Chicago audience say, you need to pay attention to them. All right. We have this is our signature event. We have a collector's home tour. Remember about people coming to your house and stealing your work? Well, everybody has, <laughs> has had a problem with that. And I've been um, a successful salesman and arm twister. Uh, I was always open to have my house open to the tour. We did our first tour in 2003, and we had four homes on it, and the response was unbelievable. People left our homes crying because they had never seen, it. these average people had never seen somebody put together art and live with it. And the impact of it was so strong 
that we decided we're going to keep doing this. So we're, we have been having our homes available uh, every year or every other year for the public to do that. And we've gotten bigger and bigger. We, we have trolleys to take them around and so forth. And we're doing one. We're having a collector's home tour on October 13th. And we're going to have three routes in Chicago. One in the Bronzeville neighborhood, one in South Shore, and then we're going and visiting uh, uh, art collectors out in the south suburbs. Okay, we have had exhibitions of these artists' work at major institutions. We're having one this year in uh, the DuSable Museum of Art. We have always been focused on educational activities, but not to educate people to be art collectors, but to respond to the need for art collectors to be informed. We're, we're giving uh, back to the art collectors things that they are interested in. And we have uh, one coming up this week uh, on how to handle your art. We, we're responding to them wanting to know things as opposed to saying they need to have this knowledge in order to be an art collector. We have a youth program. In fact, we have two youth programs uh, where we have adopted a high school and we've been doing that for eight years where we bring artists to, our, to the school and have the artists put on workshops for the students and so forth and interact with the students. The students love it. In fact, we have had phenomenal success where one of the, the, the students from the, this high school has gone on to get a Gates scholarship, full ride, the whole bit in, in art. We have a second program at the Dixon Elementary School. Uh, and in fact, Dixon is part of the organization because this elementary school it's a K through eight. It's in a regular neighborhood. It's not selective enrollment. It's not a charter school. No special nothing. And so regular, think regular school, okay? <laughs> and in that school, from the open the first door all the way up to the top is art, original art on the walls, sculptures, all kinds of tapestries and so forth. As with everything, these kids are totally immersed in art. And the uh, result is phenomenal. They are so socialized. They're, nobody's running. I, when I first went there, I just couldn't believe it. I said, you're letting kindergartners and so forth walk around this? I thought, you know, they were just tear it up. No. They are completely socialized by going and li uh, learning in an envir environment filled with art. The Chicago Magazine, just this month, rated it the seventh highest elementary school in the city of Chicago. And it is, doesn't have any sort of academic requirements and so forth for that. So we're very proud of uh, our Dixon School. We publish catalogs uh, from, the comp uh, from our uh, exhibitions. And we always have public conversations where we invite our artists in and set up an opportunity for them to make a presentation to the, to the larger public. And one of the things that we uh, have done from the beginning is that our meetings are held in places of art. We started with having meetings in our homes so that the other members of the organization could see the art collection of this particular, whoever the host was. And that, that just taken off to the point where now we have so many people that most people can't fit into their homes. <laughs> and so we've been going into galleries and art centers. And we've also gone on trips. So the next one. All right, now I'll let you see some of these things. These are images from some of our uh, collector's home tours, where here on the trolley, this person is the trolley captain explaining it, but she's an art collector. Our, our members are active and engaged, and they take on all kinds of responsibilities and activities. We have people that normally would never, list, in fact, uh, yeah, these, all three of these homes except him would have not ever let anybody come to their house before. And then after they do it, they are so happy. They find that it was such an exhilarating experience to be able to share, Irene, not be private, to share their love of art. Next one. This is again uh, on one of the tours. And these, these people were out in the suburbs and they were really hard to convince. Uh, in the past that, that they should open the door and yet now they are active and excited and want to do it again. Okay, next. Now this is the honoring concept where we pick artists 
and we have a dinner for them, we give them an award and so forth, and then give them shows and, and opportunities um, to speak on, the, on their pro programs. Next. And this is the youth program. Uh, in fact, this young lady, she's from a high school, and she picked out an artist coming through my, my collection, and she said, I want to do a presentation on this person. So I invited him over. She's now interviewing him, asking him about all the pieces that she has. She put together a formal presentation and had it at the Hyde Park Art Center. There was about seven of them. Each one picked a different artist. Next. And then we have almost always classes from high school all the way up to college coming to our homes to see because we believe that once you get in the environment, you're going to be greatly impacted you, more than what we could ever tell you. If you just go in there and see it, you're going to see the importance of our art and you will want to replicate and emulate it. All right, so we're starting with children. Here's our, uh, our next one, please. This is an example of an artist studio tour. We had uh, went to see Russell Harris. He's an artist from originally from Baltimore. He comes to Chicago, and he does uh, Trump oil paintings, uh, and he has does phenomenal things where he grinds his own pigments, he prepares his own canvases, and so forth painstakingly. And if you look at this piece, doesn't it look like that plane is sitting on that canvas? That's painted. He painted that. Next, we also have artists come to places like the Southside Community Arts Center and put on demonstrations where he is painting uh, Langston Hughes right in front of the, of the audience and he does it from scratch, right there. Uh, next, and then, like I said, we have our meetings and, social, and socializing in our collections and collections and the homes of our collectors and that sort of brings about a bonding among all of the people that are in our organization and those who are going to come into the organization by able to see collections that you would never see if you were going just around in the, the gallery scene. Next. And like I said, we bring artists in. Here at the University of Chicago, we brought in Jonathan Green to have a, a conversation. Uh, uh, he was a very, he's a very famous artist. I think most people you know about Jonathan Green. Well, a year later, after we did this at the University of Chicago, the Art Institutes of Chicago decided, oh, we want to do that too. And they emulated exactly, same people, so what? So here the Art Institute of Chicago is following diaspora rhythms. All right, next. All right, now this is getting near the end. We have a society that always looks like a, a pyramid. There's a lot of people at the bottom and then you go up and you get to the, the uh, mukti mucks up at the top or the most important. And the art scene is very similar to that. In America, and now you can have different groups, but most likely the museums, curators, and archivists, and the critics, and the journals, and so forth, are up at the top. And then you've got art schools and so forth. And guess what they do? They tell us what is good. The flow is down. It's the only aspect of the culture that has a top-down flow. We listen to them about what is good, which is creating that double consciousness and so forth. Diaspora Rhythm says, yes, go ahead. That's what you do. We're not going to fight you, but we're going to do something different. We're going to be, with our actions, we're going to be creating a bottom-up. It's where we have interactions with artists and, and art collectors, we have constant interaction with them. We are involved with social organizations, sororities, and so forth. We get involved with them, uh, and they promote the art. And we have, we have good relationship with uh, the galleries and so forth. We are essentially pushing up what we think is good. And that is going to, I think, transform the, uh, the scene. Now, I said I was from Chicago. Wait. That I was from Chicago, and I was going to end with a bluster, because it started with a boast. <laughs> All right, Chicago, if you don't know, was founded by a black man, a man from Haiti. He left Haiti in the middle of the 18th century, 1760s, 1770s, and worked his way up 
to, to Chicago, the area of Chicago, the area. And he was there in the 1770s. Philadelphia was hosting the, 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 the Congress, the first Congress and all of the Declaration of Independence, all that stuff, when he is in Chicago, the area of Chicago. Chicago was total wilderness at that time, total wilderness. And the area was a contested space. The two Native American nations, the Potawatomi in the north and the Illini in the south, fought in that area. So that was a battleground where Chicago exists. It was a battleground. So nobody wanted to live there because they knew in either direction somebody's going to come and just got to mess with you. So nobody lived in that area. He was a fur trader and very successful. He came into that area. He's French uh, from Haiti. And he made peace with the Indians. In fact, he's, he did the Ralph Bunch and negotiated a peace between these two nations. And the chief of the Potawatomi's said, what do you want? And he said, I want this land. So they gave him access to be able to live in the area where the, where the city of Chicago exists. And he quickly became very, very uh, important because he was very industrious and he built a compound and so forth had lots of buildings and stores and so forth and all the co the uh, what do you call those people that came on the wagons the kind of stuff the, the yeah they were settlers that come through that area they would always stop there and then people started gathering around him okay all right wilderness 1770s there's no roads ain't no trains and most people had to come in on canoes to the, the area where he lived. He, was, he lived right off the Chicago River. Now, quick. when he left Chicago, and he left because of the Americans, they were messing with him because he was French. He spoke French and so forth. When he left Chicago in 1800, he had built up this big empire there. The deed of sale identified everything that he had. The number of pigs, the number of nails, the hammers, and so forth. And in that deed, it lists he had 23 paintings. 23 oil paintings in 1800 in the middle of the wilderness. How do you even get them there? I, I would have a hard time getting 23 paintings to Chicago today. How do you get 23 paintings in there? So we are taking that in with great pride as we say, oh, Diaspora Rhythms, we're our collector's organization. Oh, then we got this honest. Is that we're in a city that was founded by an art collector, a black man. And so in 2005, we made a formal proclamation and inducted Jean Baptiste Pont du Sable posthumously into our organization, and we call him First Collector. Thank you very much. All right, Black Art in America fam, I hope you enjoyed this installment of Buy Your Talks. Check us out online at blackartinamerica.com and we're trying to get our YouTube subscriber numbers up, so be sure to check out that content and subscribe to our page. Again, you can always find us on your favorite social media platforms. And if you're looking for art, by legacy and contemporary artists. Be sure to visit blackartinamerica.com e-commerce site of Shop Baia. That's S-H-O-P-B-A-I-A dot com. Shop Thank you.